In a pair of recent videos, we provided an overview of World War II's New Guinea campaign, from the Japanese invasion to the savage struggle for control of the mainland to the Allied counteroffensive and victory. As we stated in those videos, the entire campaign tends to go a little under the radar, but this is especially true for one battle, one of the most crucial victories of the Pacific War and a miniature Japanese D-Day. In this video, we're going to delve deeper into the Battle of Milne Bay. By mid-1942, Imperial Japan's general plan with New Guinea and Papua was to seize Port Moresby on the island's southern coast. To do this, they would advance over the Owen Stanley Mountains via the Kokoda Track and make an amphibious invasion on Papua's eastern tip via Milne Bay. Fighting their way south and west, respectively, they would then shut their pincer on Port Moresby and deliver the Australian and Americans a crippling blow. But this was not to be. The Allies terminated the Japanese advance over the mountains, and the Battle of Milne Bay proved disastrous for the invaders who came up against a stalwart Australian defence. Like a lot of the island, the Milne Bay area didn't make for the cleanest of battlefields. While there were flat coastal areas, the land was also strewn with rivers and swamps, and floods could turn the entire place into a muddy hellscape. Of course, the mosquitoes loved this, and many of those horrible little turds were carrying malaria. Not all of Milne Bay was mud though. Some areas were flat and accessible by dirt roads and jetties. To protect Port Moresby, American General Douglas MacArthur ordered the construction of three airstrips in Milne Bay in these flatter areas. They started building Number 1 Airstrip, which is now PNG's Gurney Airport, on the 8th of June 1942, and by late July they were working on the Number 2 Airstrip. This second one, however, couldn't be completed without the construction of a couple of bridges, so they put it on the back burner and got started on number 3 airstrip. While the Battle of Milne Bay hadn't started properly yet, the Japanese caught wind of these construction projects and started strafing and bombing them. The Royal Australian Air Force staved them off, and knowing the Japanese were planning an invasion, Australian and American military personnel massed in the area. By the 22nd of August, there were almost 7,500 Australian Army and RAAF personnel and 1,365 Americans in Milne Bay. While No. 30 Squadron and No. 100 Squadron RAAF flew in later, 75 and 76 Squadrons RAAF were largely responsible for the skies and proved vital to the Allied defence. We know there were over 8,800 Allied personnel in Milne Bay by August 1942, but the Japanese didn't. They thought there were maybe 300 to 600 Aussies operating in Milne Bay, and they planned accordingly. To throw another spanner in the works, the Japanese Navy and Japanese Army were at each other's throats again. The Army refused to work with the Navy to make the landing, so the Navy took matters into its own hands. Transported to Milne Bay by the 8th Fleet, some 1,940 Japanese naval infantry from several Kaigon Okosentai, or Special Naval Landing Forces, would bring the fight to the Allies over the land. They also brought along a pair of Type 95 Hago tanks, which, in a different environment, might not have been a laughing matter. So how did it all go down? On the 23rd and 24th of August, the Japanese opened with aerial bombardments, paving the way for their fleet. On the 24th, one Japanese convoy composed of seven landing barges carrying 350 Japanese naval infantrymen pulled up on Goodenough Island to the north of Milne Bay for a rest. This was a big mistake. At around lunchtime, 12 Kitty Hawks of 75 and 76 squadrons flew to Goodenough and strafed the barges until all seven of them were ripped to shreds. For now, those 350 naval infantrymen were stranded. At the night of the 25th, the main Japanese invasion took place, with some 1,250 men landing on the north shore of the bay near a place called Wagga Wagga, a good distance east of where they had intended to land. Virtually unopposed, they established a beachhead. With sunrise, the Japanese set out through the jungle behind their Type 95s, going head to head with the Aussies. 
While the Japanese were busy with their advance, the RAAF hit their beachhead, obliterating a significant portion of their supplies and more of their landing barges. But the Japanese couldn't do jack about it. Poor weather and Allied air superiority kept their fighters on the ground. Back in the jungle, the Aussies were having a tough time with the tanks. They couldn't get their anti-tank guns into position alongside the muddy coastal track, and a Japanese cruiser was also bombarding them from the bay. With air and artillery support though, the Aussies were able to push the invaders back a bit and then withdraw west to the Gama River to catch their collective breath. As the sun rose on the 27th, eight Japanese dive bombers and 12 Zeros attacked number one airstrip but caused minimal damage. They lost one plane to defensive fire. Meanwhile, the Aussies bolstered their position along the Gama River where intense fighting took place that day and that night. Riding their tanks, the Japanese were able to inflict significant casualties on the Aussies and drive them back to the unfinished number no. 3 airstrip near a place called Kilabo. The airstrip turned out to be a solid defensive position with plenty of open space for gunning people down. The Aussies brought reinforcements to the airstrip and laid mines in anticipation of the troublesome Type 95s. Only the tanks didn't come. Both vehicles had fallen prey to the mud on the way in, and the Japanese abandoned them. Having lost one of their only advantages, the Japanese were knocked back at number no. 3 airstrip. Guided by flares and smoke shells fired by the Australian infantrymen, the RAAF Kitty Hawks soared in and had a field day, strafing the withdrawing Japanese again and again. Over the next few days, the Japanese landed more troops and supplies at Wagga Wagga and prepared for a major assault on No. 3 airstrip. At 3am on the 31st of August, they rushed it with a series of suicidal banzai attacks. The Aussies were prepared though. The Japanese ran headfirst into a killing field peppered with lit flares. Machine gun, mortar and artillery fire tore them limb from limb and the surviving naval infantrymen picked up their guts and fled back into the jungle. This was a pivotal moment in the Battle of Milne Bay. As the sun rose, and with the Japanese on their back foot, the Aussies launched a counterattack. Over the next two days, it became obvious to the Japanese that they were fighting a losing battle. Naturally, they now intended to give the Aussies as hard of a time as possible by playing as dirty as possible. On the 2nd of September, Japanese commander Minoru Yanu radioed the following message to his superiors. We have reached the worst possible situation. We will together calmly defend our position to the death. One of their go-to tactics was to play dead or wounded until the Aussies were right up next to them, then come to life and attack. According to Australian Sergeant Arthur Trail, as our officer crossed into the vanguard, a Jap, apparently wounded, cried out for help. The officer walked over to aid him, and as he did, the Jap sprang to life and hurled the grenade which wounded him in the face. From then on, the only good Jap was a dead one. The Aussies shot or bayoneted any dead bodies they came across just to be sure and stopped taking prisoners. As for the Japanese, they had already been mutilating and executing the Australian troops they'd captured, not to mention all the locals they raped and killed. Throughout this time, the flyboys continued to tear through the withdrawing Japanese, paving the way for the advancing Australian infantrymen. By the 5th, the Japanese High Command, despite Yano's eagerness to stay behind and die, ordered a withdrawal from Milne Bay. Over the next two days, they evacuated their remaining troops from the bay, leaving behind more than 600 corpses. Some Japanese naval infantrymen tried to flee overland, but the Aussies mopped them up. The Japanese weren't able to rescue their troops stranded on Goodenough Island until the 24th of October. In contrast, 167 Aussies were killed or declared missing in action, while 206 were wounded. Winning the Battle of Milne Bay, the Allies continued turning the Milne Bay area into an airbase and built a wharf there too. They also got absolutely drilled by a malaria epidemic, which probably caused more damage than the Japanese. With Milne Bay out of their reach, the Japanese strategy for Port Moresby crumbled. The Allied victory at Milne Bay did wonders for morale, often referred to as the first major defeat of Japanese forces on land. In the words of British Field Marshal Bill Slim, Australian troops had, at Milne Bay in New Guinea, inflicted on the Japanese their first undoubted defeat on land. Of all the Allies was the Australian soldiers who first broke the spell of the invincibility of the Japanese army. We'd love to know what you think though. 
Had you heard of the Battle of Milne Bay before today? Do you know anything about the battle that we didn't cover? And lastly, how crucial do you think the Australian victory was to the overall Allied war effort? Let us know all that and more in the comment section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.